upon graduating from high school, I knew I wanted to be a nurse, so I went for my training, my education, and became a nurse to make rounds and to see someone at end of life, to see them struggling, to see them alone. I just, it hit me, you know, it just hit me like, this isn't right. Um, this isn't right that people have to die alone at the end of the hall, frightened and afraid, and very often in pain. You cannot work day after day and, and see what I would see at night without having some tug at yourself to figure it out, make sure it can be better. I always felt that I couldn't let the patients down that people were counting on me. When you know somebody needs what you have to give, you figure out how to make it happen. The goal was to change end of life care forever and for the better. This woman here, Joanne Hively, she wrote the uh, grant to the Healthcare Financing uh, Administration, which was multiple pages, much, multiple data that had to be pulled together. And I describe it as you know, 15 pounds of paper going out to HICVA via Federal Express uh, because it took that much. We did excellent work, we were reimbursed for it. And this data was then going to be analyzed and used and maybe there'd be a Medicare benefit. We had both Republicans and Democrats, Senator Dole, Hines, Leon Panetta from California, a small group that said, okay, we're gonna get this done for you and pass legislation for hospice care. We wrote all the standards. I always tell people you can blame me for part of the standards if you don't like them because we wrote them, uh, we submitted them. While the team was predominantly female that was on this legislative task force, the male partners were, I would say, very brilliant with strategy. So everybody brought what they could bring to this. We never thought, oh, aren't we special? It was just doing what you needed to do for the people back home who were waiting for you. We educated uh, those decision makers. And in August of 1982, our legislation passed at midnight, tacked to some bill. I don't know what bill it was tacked onto, but we had a temporary hospice Medicare benefit in 82. And in 1986, it became a permanent benefit. was something about Mary Taverna when she walked into a room. She would walk in and there was just something about feeling like sit up a little bit, give her your attention. Uh, there was no one that I um, knew that could inspire you like Mary Taverna could. I just try really hard every day to always remember uh, what Mary stood for and um, try to be that leader and provide that wonderful work environment that's purposeful. The part of hospice medicine that spoke to me was in providing care the way I felt that all patients should get care, uh, with a robust interdisciplinary team that comes to your home for a really reasonable cost. I think everyone should have that. We are really one of the only organizations uh, in our area that serves ch pediatrics and we have hospice kids that we care for. We also have children that are chronically and seriously ill that we care for, and that's a real differentiator for us because there aren't a lot of organizations uh, that are set up to be able to take care of kids that are home, and we're really proud of that. When we were doing all the legislation, the work, and everything that we did in those earlier days, it was all about adult care. Pediatric care was not even on the radar screen. We didn't have the expertise as a number of hospice providers to provide palliative care to pediatric patients. When we had the expertise hired on staff who could take pediatric care forward, we launched it. We are from North Africa, from Sudan actually, but we never live in that country. Uh, we live in Middle East. Uh, we used to work there. We decided as a family to move to to United States because because our kids at that time in Saudi Arabia in school there is no there was no sport activities for 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 girls, and we just gave up everything. We came and it uh, the first year two years were very very difficult for us as a family. And you live for your kids. I mean, 
it's most important that to plan something that can can open opportunity for them you know not, not restrict what they can do or what they can have or what they can achieve so i think the, the movement that we decided that to move here it's i think open that door for them i have three kids Lorraine, 17 years old and i have yazan he's turning 12 next week and tala she is a 14 years old she was sweet from day one she was happy child she enjoyed, you know, dancing, music, friends. She hugged everybody. She loved everybody. She, 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 she's a sweet child. She's a very sweet child. She was fine. She was having her cousins over, and then they slept kind of late. She slept, and she wake up twitching. And then by the end of the day, it was kind of the whole arm until the shoulder. By the evening, it was really wasn't good, it wasn't improving, uh, getting mm. worse. We took her to that doctor and she said we need to admit her right away to the hospital. So uh, we admitted her two days. The third day she went unconscious. She went to kind of coma and it was the beginning of a new life for her and for us. Jace. Hi, Lily. Hi, Jace. Hi, Lily. Jace is a little person, and along with being a little person, he has some respiratory issues that require him to be trached. And also, he has a severe oral aversion, and he's fed through a G tube. He doesn't really walk, he can scoot around and get where he needs to go. Um, he's a hilarious child. He finds humor in everything. He loves music. He loves his family, especially his big brother. You just can't help but be happy when you're around him. When we were at UCSF, he was the child that never got moved. He was the child that never got messed with because he was too fragile. In the beginning, they told us he would never come home. He would never be off a ventilator and he would basically just live in a facility for the rest of his life. We were told some very grim things and we didn't believe that. Kids who are well enough are still kids. So they're still funny and they're playful and they want to engage in childlike things. They want to play games, they want to do arts and crafts, they want to show off their newest gift or toy or whatever it is. When we came in the house, Jace was just terrified. All we did was like say hi and he was just crying and just so afraid. He had spent much of his life in an institution with his mom, either in the hospital or in this like skilled nursing facility for kids. In the beginning, I didn't really know what they were about, to be honest. I was like, okay, it's another person that's going to be a part of his care. And I kind of just chalked it up to that at first, but they've become so much more than that. You're not just working with a child, you're working with the whole family. And so you get to work with a parent who's an adult and the child who's sick and if their siblings are helping them. And if I can make the challenge the family is facing even a little bit easier, then that feels great. Hey there. When he learned how to climb on the couch, he was super excited to show us on Zoom. Look what I can do now. So I think he gets that we're on his side, like we're on his team. They have helped him blossom into the child that he is today because they helped reassure him that not everyone that comes into your life is going to do something bad or they're not there to change anything. So he needed that. He needed to know that people could come in and just be with him and have fun, and then they could go. One of our doctors told me about by hospice, by the vacates, and just the hospice word make me kind of say no immediately. I don't want it. We can take off a guy, child, and we want to take off child. This thing we love to do. For it takes me a year uh, until I realize that me and my daughter, we need a lot of support. 
It's gonna be a long way. I cannot do it by myself. Early on, it was very clear that she felt like all the care providers had given up on Tala. I remember going to one medical appointment in particular where she was being told a bunch of services were stopping because Tala wasn't progressing and walking out with her and she was just in tears and just said like they've all given up on her and I'm not going to give up on her. After Heather gave Tala a nurse uh, through the organization, now I have a nurse for Tala. So she make it happen. This is very important for us that, you know, we are new. Right? We don't know what is available. So having like like an organization that guide us on what what we can have, what what option we have and what from where we can support. I mean, being advocate for us is for Tala. It's, I mean, we've seen a lot of tapping. We couldn't do by ourselves. Adrian has a very unique way of getting through and saying, hey, it is scary and it's okay to be scared, but remember these things. Mama, what did we talk about with Miss Adrian about with, um, it was like when I was in the hospital and I got scared. That it's okay to be scared? Yeah. And just to ask questions? Yep. My Mama always will be here. <laughs> Anytime I hear the word hospital, I'm always freaking out and I get really angry because even if it's just for a checkup, sometimes I could find something wrong and with him, I don't know, I never, I never like it because anything could happen and I've always wanted a brother my whole life. There's no like quote unquote cure for what he's got. It never hurts to have someone in the background that can help you navigate this very arduous and confusing system that our children are in. He works hard to, to get to where he is now. He's worked really hard, as his whole family has. They just are so devoted to him. With all of us being back together, he's thriving, speaking in paragraphs. He's modified a crawl for himself and we all sit back and relish in it so because these were days that we were never promised i enjoy going to the movies with my kids like you know animation movies and we had a lot of fun doing this with tala all the moments were happy moments I can drive my wife crazy that she was more close to me, and uh, I don't know if, she, if my wife admit that, but but yeah, she 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 was close to me. Sorry. I think people tend to think about grief and loss if someone's died, but they don't necessarily know about the losses they already have experienced. Like your child who used to talk with you cannot talk anymore. Your child who used to play tennis and the clarinet and go to school and be funny. Like that's all gone and just making space for that too like the hope but also the, the grief and the loss because it's all mixed in together we miss her like we miss to hear her voice i want to just hear her voice and i want to hear mommy's word from her again i said if she cannot walk i'm okay with that but they want her just to talk to me she told me how she's feeling And she will call she call she will call my name. It's the first thing she will say. I hope that Tala she can slowly recover. I mean without hope life would be very difficult so so always we have a hope that I mean sometimes we hear from doctors from you know we think that things are very difficult but we still have a hope I mean without the hope is life is it's, it's very hard
there's no duty to destroy hope. We have no, that's not a part of our job description. We are often hoping alongside the patient. I hope all the time. I hope that in fact, the patient will instead get stronger and this will have been a bad dream and they'll be a full and robust human person in their body again. I hope that all the time. And that hope has to be aligned with the reality of what's happening. Families are all living through heartbreaking, challenging, tragic times, but the resilience and the capacity to find hope and to still find joy and to have incredible love, like, it's so beautiful. We learned that it's not only about the physical health, it's also about the emotional health, the practical things, um, the uh, spiritual things, and then, of course, the grief that, that follows after. There's a bunch of stuff for us to learn, but we learned as we went, and our patients were very helpful in teaching us. They were the teachers. My mom developed Alzheimer's, and they say people go happy or angry sometimes uh, with this disease, but she went happy. All of a sudden, I just started crying. I had no idea what was the matter with me. I went out and stood on the pier, and I called hospice, and I said, do you still have counseling available? And she said, oh, you know, let me have somebody call you. So I stood out there, and I looked at the water for a little while. I went back in, and I got a call in about 10 minutes. I took all of the sessions available, and made a dear friend of the therapist afterwards. When I was going through this counseling, though, the woman said to me, uh, Robin said, you know, I think you would be a really good volunteer at hospice. I thought, I think this is something I can do. I understand how difficult to, you know, um, to lose someone that, that, that you really love and care. So I lost my parents and I realized, you know, I experienced that. And also I want to bring that experience to encourage other people to help them walk through that difficult times. Uh, and so that, that really helped me and to make the decision so to, uh, to, move, to move on into like chaplaincy and to be a hospice chaplain. So, and then I found that very meaningful and very fulfilling also. The Chinese population in San Francisco was very underrepresented. And we started to think about how can we better serve this population and we built this team that we're so proud of. The Chinese community, maybe they are afraid of talking about death and dying. My understanding is like sometimes they look at hospice as more like uh, giving up, but, um, but it's different. Hospice is not like about giving up, but hospice is about like finding meaning in the midst of, the, of this like, uh, situation. Yongigo Oh, 
誒主耶穌嘅祈求。係、嗯嗯，好感謝。You learn when you do hospice work to respect all types of of people, all living situations. You don't know anyone's history, and you only know what you're presented with in the moment. And、um, again, we turned no one away. We serve anyone. We'll go anywhere and serve any patient, wherever they live. Regardless of their life circumstances, ability to pay. Working the tenderloin, you you tend to deal with people one on one. I deal with, you know, people with lots of mental illness and people with that,、uh, you know, maybe the family doesn't know how to deal with them anymore, and are estranged. People that have learned how to survive, and. Learn whatever whatever life's thrown their way, they have to adjust. I like to sit down and talk with people and just hang out and try to make them as comfortable as possible. That's the whole concept. You come into this world needing help. You leave this world, you also need help, also. And that's what I like to do. It's kind of help you out, make sure you're as comfortable as possible. Covid changed everything overnight. I mean, we went from having 200 people in this building on a Friday to having 10 in the building on Monday, and that's how quickly things changed. I've been shocked and amazed over and over again by people's willingness、um, to just keep doing their work, their meaningful work, despite. The worries that they may have, despite the fears that they may have, it just speaks to the mission of these frontline healthcare workers, who understand and they're right that、um, they are the link between patients getting adequate care and not getting care. I'm from Haiti. I've been living in Marin County for ten years. The U.S. gave me another opportunity to. We build myself. We build my economy. We build everything I lost. Okay, now guys, we're gonna go with the dumping process. But let me tell you, if you make any mistake on the dumping, that's where you're gonna contaminate yourself, your loved one, and you're gonna be in trouble. You're gonna remove the. Gloves. There is a way to remove the gloves. I consider it this part dirty, but the inside is clean. I'm gonna remove my gloves. This part is clean. I can do this. Don't pull the face shield up, but pull it away from your body. In the top part, away from my face. Okay, I'm on call. As soon as I get the tiger text, I'm ready to go. We're gonna start pretty soon. Okay. Bye, Ada. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Hey, hey, Zaga. How you doing? Good.
there's been so many things like that where there's been this extraordinary focus on um, the safety of our staff. And what I've loved about it is that it's had to happen really fast. And we are an organization that is often focused on doing things perfectly. And this pandemic has pressed us to do things really well and quickly, but not perfectly. And I think the tolerance of imperfection in deference to a kind of common goal has been a really good, a really good lesson for all of us. Always at the back of my mind is, you know, our staff is so extraordinary and willing to rise to the occasion. And I always worry, when do, when do they, you know, feel so depleted by the kind of being on for so long um, that they begin to struggle? Once we got the Zoom thing going, I think it made the, for a lot of families, I think it's working really well. I think they feel good, supported and connected and and still there's a few kids who will pretty much every week say to me like, I miss you, when are you gonna come visit? And it's just kind of heartbreaking. It is a, uh, a temporary step back in my opinion, because I believe that uh, people who are dying need to be surrounded by people who love them. I can't imagine how difficult it is for loved ones not to be able to get in to see their mother, not being able to get in to see their father because of COVID. I hope that once we get this behind us, that we can go back to um, normalizing uh, end of life and making sure that you are surrounded by the people that care about you. I was born and raised in Asheville, North Carolina. My husband's brother was stationed at Travis Air Force Base. And he called us one day and he says, Nathaniel, you and your wife come to California, the land of the free, the land of opportunity, the land of everything, <laughs> you know. We have lived here for 50 years. We really see the future of medicine more and more in the home. And uh, one of the things that we are really good at is taking care of people in their homes. I really love the idea of people meeting us earlier on and not just at end of life. There's no obligation to do them every single day, but if your back's feeling tight, then you want to be doing those in the morning when you wake up. And then maybe in the midday, if you're feeling like a little tight and painful, then you can do some of those back exercises. I feel like being able to move is one of the best things that you can help someone do. I feel like it's applicable to every single human that everybody wants to be able to move and be active and ha have independence. Did I have you on that paper? Does it say keep the foot straight? Those turn out? No, is that half stretch? Is it just for the left one? Yeah, it's really just that just left, left side. side. Perfect. All right, and then the last one maybe we can go over is the lunges, because we haven't done those ones in a little bit either. Okay. And you also don't have to reach towards the ground. You can stay upright. Yep, and then we're just doing a little bend down. Arista, she was like an angel. Very delicate with the way she did things. She would, would say to me, she'd say, you know, you can do this. You're gonna be okay. Uh, just, I'll help you through everything. And that's exactly what she did. For a lot of patients, leaving the house is like a lot of effort. You know, even if they can do it, it's like a huge ordeal. And by the time they get there, they've used up all their energy. And then the session can't be very productive. It's so much more convenient and um, nicer for the patient because we come right to them. And then when we go over exercises, we can make sure that we're giving you something you can do because we saw you do it. It's just a lot of great information. It's just a wealth of um, information that if we're doing what we say to do, then it's 
I can totally think that's helping my mother. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Big we want to give you the tools yeah, yeah, yeah. so that when we're gone, you have the information. You know, yeah. you're not reliant on us, but right. you actually have the tools to do it yourself. Right, right. And now you can stand up without holding on, and you can do almost six in 30 seconds compared to two before. Mm -hmm. That's a huge difference. So your legs are stronger, your cardiovascular system is stronger. So we've measured it and seen that you've made a lot of progress. I have a book for every single day. I do her vitals every single morning. The nurses come, I wait for them to do the vitals. And then the therapy comes. Um, and she's here today because of the therapy and the nurses. So it's a godsend. And I think the physical therapy and whatnot helped my mom to how she is today. There is a need for this organization, Hospice by the Bay, to expand its services We've been doing this for 46 years. We could have stayed uh, a hospice, um, but what Mary understands is that things change. Care at home is expanding. The way that we conceptualize how we receive care is expanding more. There's the potential for um, a really fantastic um, synergy between the different branches of the organization. We've already started seeing that. People who begin on palliative care and then refer to hospice, or people who start with home health and then are referred to palliative care. And um, this sense of kind of having an umbrella organization that can really hold on to a patient and, and accompany them through the changes in their care and in their lives. Taking hospice out of the name is important. It holds us back in terms of the vision that we see. And so the, the passion I have right now is to really integrate the vision we have for taking care of people at home and expanding that vision to be um, beyond hospice care. The organization is not changing. The ownership isn't changing. Staffing isn't changing. The values aren't changing. None of those important things that they've experienced are changing. What is changing is the opportunity to do more good for more people with our same values and our same principles, as opposed to not embracing an opportunity that comes to you and you know you can do it well. Respecting people where they are, that's more important to Mary than anything, that we're able to do that as we continue to look at serving people under palliative care or under home health care. And that, that value continues with us. If someone come to work for hospice, that's the last place you're gonna work. You're not gonna go anywhere else. <laughs> you know? Because let me tell you something. On hospice, they give us the tools to do our job. They give us the love to do our job, and they give us the respect to do our job. Tools, love, respect, what else we can ask. Our staff is so humble and such um, incredible examples of just doing good work with no expectation of any type of kind of glory or acclaim. They just do good work quietly with people who are suffering. And that is extraordinary. I will forever be proud of the organization and the fact that I was able to contribute so much and that people behind me who come behind me have taken it so far. Shower head. Yes, shower head. <laughs> <laughs>
I used to dance all the time. I love to dance. Turn on music and it, then it, oh, good Lord. But I, I, I just like to have a good time. I really like to have a good time. She likes I, wine, too. I like wine. Can't drink wine for now. I like antiques. She loves antiques. I like to shop. She loves like Macy's <laughs> and Trader Joe's. I just want to express how, how we are grateful for, for for what you are doing for us and for, for us and for other people that they are very grateful that they couldn't achieve or get the support without without you being an advocate for their kids and for for their families and and, and you know thank you thank you thank you for that really 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 thank you for that <laughs>